in the book of Psalm. And together we shall read Psalm 85. Psalm 85. The Lord, thou hast been favorable unto thy land. Thou hast brought back the captivity of Jacob. Thou hast forgiven the iniquity of thy people. Thou hast covered all their sins. Thou hast taken away all thy wrath. Thou hast turned thyself from the fierceness of thine anger. Turn us, O God, of our salvation, and cause thine anger toward us to cease. Wilt thou be angry with us forever? Wilt thou draw out thine anger to all generations? Wilt thou not revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee? Show us thy mercy, O Lord, and grant us thy salvation. I will hear what God the Lord will speak for he will speak peace to his people and to his saints. But let them not turn again to folly. Surely his salvation is nigh them that fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. Mercy and truth are met together, righteousness and peace have kissed each other. A truth that shall spring out of the earth and righteousness to look down from heaven. Yea, the Lord shall give that which is good, and our land shall yield her increase. Righteousness shall go before him and shall set us in the way of his steps. The Lord will bless that reading from his word. Now you turn with me to verse 6. Let's read verses 5 and 6. Wilt thou be angry with us forever? Wilt thou draw out to thine anger to all generations? Wilt thou not revive us again that thy people may rejoice in thee. I mentioned the other evening that uh, I would be speaking this afternoon on principles that govern spiritual quickening. And I would also tell you something of how God in his mercy met with me and brought revival to this heart and life of mine. Wilt thou not revive us again, that thy people, thy people, may rejoice in thee? These words of the psalmist express the heart cry of many of God's dear children today. There is without question a growing conviction in many quarters that unless revival comes, that is a God-sent revival, other forces that are out to defy every known Christian principle will take the field. Indeed, uh, the observant eye can already see shadows a slant a world that is ripening and ripening fast for repentance or judgment. With uh, that conviction, there seems to be a growing hunger for God to manifest 
his power. And uh, so intense is the hunger and so deep the longing that uh, the cry of the prophet of old is frequently heard upon the lips of God's children. Oh, that thou wouldst rend the heavens and come down that the mountains might flow before thy presence. You will observe that in that prayer of the prophet, two fundamental things are suggested. That unless God comes down, mountains will not flow and sinners will not tremble. But if God comes down, if God manifests his power, if God shows his hand, if God takes the field, mountains will flow. Mountains of indifference, Mountains of materialism, mountains of humanism will flow before his presence and nations, not just individuals, but nations shall be made uh, to tremble. We haven't seen nations trembling but we have seen communities, we have seen districts, we have seen parishes in the grips of God in the matter of hours. When God came down, it is true that we have seen man's best endeavor in the field of evangelism, leaving the community untouched. We have seen crowded churches. We have seen many professions. We have seen hundreds, yes, and thousands responding to what you speak of here as the altar call. But I want to say this, dear people, and I say it without fear of contradiction, that you can have all that without God. Now that may startle you, but I see again you can have all that on human level. Howard Spring was white when he wrote, The kingdom of God is not going to be advanced by our churches becoming filled with men, but by men in our churches becoming filled with God. And there's a difference. Oh no, crowded churches, deep interested in church activity, is possible on mere human level. Leaving the community untouched. The difference between successful evangelism, and I use the word successful, and uh, revival is this. In evangelism, you have the two, the three, the ten, the twenty, and possibly the hundred, 
making confession of Jesus Christ. And at the end of the year, you are thankful if half of them are standing. But the community remains untouched. The public houses are crowded. The dances, dancing saloons packed. The theater in the picture house patronized by the hundred. No change in the community. But in revival, when God the Holy Ghost comes, when the winds of heaven blow, suddenly the community becomes God conscious, a God realization takes hold of young, middle age and old, so that as in the case of the Hebridean revival, 75% of those saved one night were saved before they came near a meeting. The fear of God the beginning of wisdom. That is where the difference comes in between evangelism and revival. And that is why I say our only hope is not in crusade. Thank God for all that has been accomplished. Thank God for all that is being done through missions. I think a mission in Scotland, we have also workers in Canada. And we thank God for all that is being accomplished through the efforts of ministers and evangelists and Christian workers bringing one here and two there to a saving knowledge of Jesus. But our supreme need and the only answer to the problem that confronts the Christian church today is a visitation from God. Let me illustrate what I mean by an incident that happened not in Lewis or in Jewish, but on the small island of Berner. I was addressing the Bender Convention. The Bender Convention. Could you direct me to the nearest minister. We have no minister on the island just now. Both churches are vacant. Would you then direct me to the nearest elder? Yes, the nearest elder lives in that uh, house on the hill. So I said to the lad, would you mind going up to the elder and tell him that Mr. Campbell has come to the island. And he asked, what Campbell? Tell him the Campbell who was on the island of Louis. So the young lad went up. And after a few minutes came back and said, Hector McKinnon was expecting you to arrive today. And uh, you are to stay with his brother and he has asked me to tell you that uh, he has intimated a meeting in the church for nine o'clock tonight and he expects you to address it. Now, uh, explain that as you will. Here 
was a man who, on the morning of the day that I sat in the church in Bangor Island, decided to spend the day in prayer. He was concerned about the parish, particularly concerned about the state of the young people. Growing up in a state of indifference to God and to the church. His wife told me that on three occasions she went to the door of the barn where he was praying and she heard him pray, God, I do not know where he is, but you know, and you send him. About ten o'clock that evening, he was possessed of the conviction that God heard his cry, and that I would be on the island on this particular day, hence the intimation that I would preach in the church at nine o'clock that evening. We went to the church. Quite a considerable congregation gathered, about 80. The service was a very ordinary service. Indeed, uh, at the end I wondered, after all, if I was led to the island. But there were men there nearer to God than I was. My dear people, we've got to be honest. This old man that I already referred to came to me and said, I hope you are not disappointed that revival hasn't come to the church tonight, but God is hovering over us, and he will break through any minute. Here is a man near to God. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him. We are now walking down from the church. The church is on a hillock. The main road is down about 300 yards beneath, below the church. The congregation are moving down. We are walking behind them when suddenly, oh, this is what I'm getting at, noting the difference between evangelism and revival. Suddenly, the elder stands, takes off his hat. Stand, Mr. Campbell. God has come. God has come. See what is happening. And I looked toward the congregation, and I saw them falling on their knees among the heather. I heard the cry of the penitent. And that meeting that began at 11 o'clock that night, continued on the hillside until four o'clock in the morning. The island was suddenly gripped by God. By God. Was it because Campbell went to the island? Banish the thought. Banish the thought. I thank God for the privilege and how thankful I am that I was near enough to God in that pulpit to hear his voice. Hallelujah. I've often thought of that. Oh, I've often thought of it. If I was out of touch with God, if I was not in the place where I could hear the voice of the Savior, the voice of God, would Berner have missed that mighty visitation that took the island from center to circumference? 
I question if there was one single house on the island that wasn't visited that night. An awareness of God, a consciousness of God, seemed to hover over the very atmosphere. The very atmosphere seemed to be charged with the power of Almighty God. That revival. But note the principle brought into operation in my people, called by my name, humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I in heaven here come and heal their land. There was at least one man on that island who fulfilled the conditions of that one passage of Scripture. And because he fulfilled the conditions, God being a covenant-keeping God must be true to his covenant engagement. And God to vindicate his own honor had to listen to the prayer of the pious postman who knelt in a barn for a day. The principle that governs spiritual quickness. Oh, that God may find a people ready to fulfill and to comply with the governing principle relative to spiritual quickening. Now let me touch, first of all, on the origin of revival. You have it in this verse. Wilt thou not revive us again? My dear people, we do well to remember that in the whole field of Christian experience, the first step is and remains with God. We want to remember that. Thought, feeling, endeavor must find their basis, must find their inspiration in the sovereign mercy of God. Now I believe that. I believe it with all my heart. I remember making that statement at a conference outside of London some time ago. And at the close of the conference, the German overheard a certain titled lady say, that uh, was uh, a wonderful address that we listened to, but uh, I don't agree with all that he said, particularly to the sovereignty of God. But we must not forget that uh, the dear man was born and brought up among the hills of Scotland. And, uh, well, that is his background and he can't help it. Hallelujah. <laughs> yes, my dear people, let me see again. In the field of revival, God is sovereign. But I hasten to say that I do not believe in any conception of sovereignty that nullifies man's responsibility. 
God is the God of revival. But we are the human agents through which revival is possible. And God found that man in the postman of Banara. I believe this to be the reason for so few making contact with Christ that is vital. To be one of the most disturbing features of present day evangelism. Let me say, present day evangelism is our overemphasis on what man can do. Come to the front. Raise your hand. Respond to the altar call. Come to Jesus and be happy. God have mercy on us. I say, God have mercy on us. Man, in the final analysis, can do nothing but throw himself on the sovereign mercy of God. Oh, let's get that clear. Not no time in theology. It's New Testament theology. It's Old Testament theology. I'm tired, positively tired, of this gospel of simply believing. Amen. Oh, there's a difference between human faith and saving faith. I heard a prominent evangelist in Britain say something that really startled me. He said, uh, you exercise faith in a play. You go into that plane and uh, you exercise faith that that plane will take you to your destination. You go into a steamer, you exercise faith in the steamer and in the captain and crew to take you uh, to your destination. Exercise that faith in the promises of God. Did you ever hear or listen to such nonsense? That human thing! That human thing! But very faith is not human thing! Great passage, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ, he liveth in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of Paul. Oh no, oh no, that wouldn't get him very far. I live by the faith of the Son of God. The faith of God. Now I'm convinced of this, that if this truth was stressed, there will be less appeal. If this truth was stressed, our crusades and campaigns would not be producing harvests of incidents. If men and women would but recognize that glorious truth, they shall seek me and shall find me when they shall search for me with all their heart. That means that they may not find them tonight, they may not find them tomorrow night, they may not find them next week, they may not find them for a month or for six months. But if they're seeking God with all their heart, they're going to find him. Or God is not true to his covenant engagement. Oh, let's get this clear. It comes into revival. That's why I could count upon my fine fingers all that I spoke to about their soul during the whole of the three years I was in the midst of.
You see, in the northwest of Scotland, if you were to press yourself and your advice and your help upon an anxious soul, you would be inclined to believe that it was man's work. Just man's work. And he would much rather be left so that God himself would handle him. That's why we have known people for weeks and longer in distress of soul before light broke in upon them. But you go back to those villages today. I'm glad I see Mr. McFarlane of the Faith Mission here. He was up in Lewis not so very long ago. He was in a village that saw the mighty movings of God. I never spoke to one single person in that village in an endeavor to help them to find the Savior. We just left them to God and God did it. And that's why you haven't a single backslider in the whole of that community. Oh, my dear people, when God does a work, he does it well. You can go back. You can go back again. And you'll find them pressing on with the God that revealed not only himself to them, but revealed himself in them. God, said David, God is the God of our salvation, the fact of ultimate reality. Surely is this. That salvation is of God. I was asked recently to help a young woman. She was a nurse in Glasgow now home in the Hebrides, and she was in terrible distress of soul, and the distress continued for a long period. Her father thought that perhaps a word from me might help her. So I called, and I found the young woman in a terrible state, fearfully distressed about her soul, the sense of guilt, the sense of unworthiness, and behind it all the question, am I in the covenant? Am I in the covenant? So I knelt beside her and uh, did my best uh, to help her. And I quoted that great verse of scripture that I so often quote, John 10 and 27, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, never can any man pluck them out of my Father's hand. And I quoted it again. And I tried to point out the two supreme characteristics of the sheep for whom Christ died. They hear his voice, and they follow. Have you heard his voice? Oh, have you heard his voice, young people? Have you heard his voice? It's different from the voice of man, the voice of the shepherd, speaking the word of conviction, speaking the word of pardon, speaking the word of assurance, speaking the word of power. Have you heard the voice of the shepherd? I spoke along these lines, and then she looked at me through her tears. 
And said, Mr. Campbell, I thank you for your kindly words of counsel. But surely, surely, as a minister, you believe that a verse of Scripture won't save you. Have you got it? <laughs> oh, have you got it? There are thousands today living under a self-created delusion and a delusion given birth to in our evangelistic crusade who have nothing to rest upon but a verse of Scripture. Are you saved by a verse of Scripture? Listen to the poet. The promise can say, though the promise is sure, tis the blood we get under that cleanses us through. It cleanses me now. Hallelujah to God. I rest on the promise, but I'm under the blood. That's it. Amen. That's it. Be John. Beyond the sacred page, I see thee, Lord. I seek thee, Lord. My spirit yearns for thee, thou living word. Tell me, has the living word spoken? Has the living word spoken? Or are you just holding on to a verse of scripture? So she said, surely, you are not suggesting that a verse of scripture will save me. My heart cries for Jesus. That's it. My heart cries for Jesus and Jesus four or five days after that revealed himself in us. Revealed himself in us. And she was gloriously saved. And the day she rests upon the promise. She feeds upon the world that brings her to Jesus. The origin then, God, and the way God works, I think we've seen that. But uh, his agents are his people. God, as I already said, is the God of revival. He is sovereign. But as I already said, I quote again, we do not believe in any conception of sovereignty that nullifies my responsibility. And to say, as many do today, well, we can do nothing. We just have to wait for the wind to blow. Well, that may be a very accommodating doctrine to the man that he is in Zion, but it will not stand in the light of divine revelation. If my People called by my name will pray. I wonder how many of us are praying. We are the human agents through which revival is possible. Let me ask this question. Are you in the place where God can 
trust Jews with revival. He is sovereign. He is supernatural. But he comes down and in his sovereign purpose and wise economy he has placed this pressure in Ephraim vessel. Are you one that he can use? Are you one that he can trust? Are you in intimate fellowship with God? I'm sure some of you will have heard of that lovely Scottish saint by the name of Murray McCain, died at 27, but left his mark, an indelible mark, on Scotland. Murray McCain was wonderfully used in revival prior to the disruption of 43. It was the revivals of McCain and Boner and others that led to that great disruption when the free church left the establishment. Murray McCain said this, If we are to walk worthy of our high and holy calling, we must live in daily consideration of the greatness and glory of Jesus. That's it now. Living in daily consideration the greatness and the glory of Jesus. The man who is there is just the man that God can trust. With revival, he is sovereign, but I am the instrument that he wills to you. Oh, tell me, friend, tell me, are you there? Now, I want to close my talk by telling you something of how God, in his mercy, met with me. I think I must go back to the days of my conversion. I was converted under strange circumstances. I cannot take time to tell it all, but I was a piper and a step dancer, and I was playing in a concert and dance outside of Oban when God spoke to me. God spoke to me in the dance. And I had a praying father and a praying mother. And I left the dance and went home, shut myself in the barn, knelt among the straw, prepared for the horses in the morning and cried, God, I do not know how to come, I know not what to do, but if you save me as I am, I am coming now when God saved me. God saved me. And I say here today that never for one single moment had I ever any occasion to doubt the work that God did in my heart that morning. God did a sovereign and supernatural work and set me gloriously free. I believe that I can honestly say that godliness, godliness characterized every part of my being, body, soul, and spirit. In my wonderful experience, and I'm not talking of sanctification or the deeper life. I'm just talking of a soul born again. When God just the word. But shortly after that, I joined the forces and found myself in France during the past world war. And I wasn't long there until I discovered that there were powers resident within me that were more than a match for me. You see, I was cradled in the midst of godliness. And I was sheltered in a godly home. But now I found myself 
in the midst of extreme ungodliness. Extreme ungodliness. And I soon discovered, as I already said, forces resident within me that were more than a match for me. Again and again I cried, O oh God, speak the word of deliverance along this particular avenue. However, to make a long story short, I'm in a cavalry charge. And in that cavalry charge, I at last found myself lying on the battlefield, badly wounded. I thank God for a young trooper of the Canadian youth of yours with a dramatic confrontation with a mighty God. Now Moses, what is that in your hand? And if he finds what in his hand, what is in his hand, we look at ours. What is in your hand? A degree? A series of degrees? What is in your hand? An ability to speak? An ability to think? What is in your hand? A musical ability? What is it? Somebody you love? Some plan you wouldn't abandon for the world? What is it? An estimation of yourself? An image that you have of who you are and how great you are? What is it you have in your hand? Something good? Something bad? What is it you have in your hand? And whatever it is God says to you, throw it down. Lord, I don't understand. I've never concluded that my gift was anything that would ever bother you. Don't care. Pour it down. Now listen. As long as Moses held in his hand that rod, it could do no more than Moses could do because it was nothing more than a common rod in the hand of a common man. Now I want to tell you something else. And not only could it do no more than Moses could do at his very best, but as long as there is something in a man's hand, in a man's life, whether it's good or bad, that has never been thrown down before God for his approval or disapproval, for his sanctification, it has a serpent in it. I've known men whose preaching ability was the worst enemy they had. I've known men and women whose abilities in the flesh at last hung like a serpent and poisoned their lives because those talents were never thrown down and sanctified before the Lord. And I can see that serpent as it writhes and hisses on the ground, looking for somebody, looking for somebody to inject its venom into. And I can hear it as it hisses on the ground, and I can almost hear what it is. It's self. Self. For oh, you see that thing which stands between you and the fullness of the Spirit? That which stands between you and the fullness of power, whatever it is, whatever reason you give, it's that old serpent self. And he threw it down and it became a serpent. And the Lord said, Moses, now you can pick it up. But I'll tell you what I want you to do, pick it up by the tail, because it'll never be yours primarily. It'll be mine. I'll handle the business end. You pick it up by the tail. Moses picks it up, and the Bible says it becomes a rod again in his hand. But remember now, something has happened to it. And if you'll read very closely that book again, you'll find that in the latter part of the chapter, it very subtly says, And Moses took the rod of God in his hand. It never been referred to as the rod of God before. Now it was the rod of God in the hand of the man of God. Before it was a common rod in the hand of a common man. Now it had been thrown down before the Lord, the snake, the self, and put back in the hand of the obedient man. Now it was the rod of God in the hand of the man of God. Do you see the difference? Do you have a talent that you're using for the Lord? Throw it down. Do you have a plan that you're absolutely certain pleases the Lord? You have a you have a self-image that you feel like really recommends you to God? Throw it down. Throw it down. You know, as a church, we've recognized that we have to throw down our spirituality. We have to throw down revival before Him. Or we'll get so wrapped up in the self of it that we'll get wound up in revival and leave Jesus out of it. Wound up in the blessings and leave Jesus out of it. We're continually having to throw down things before the Lord so he can de self them and give them back to us and we have his power. What is that in your hand? Throw it down. Throw it down. Now this is where it gets exciting. God's not through. So here goes Moses with a rod in his hand. A rod? No. The rod of God. Now it is a rod touched of God. 
Here is a life yielded to God and a rod cut to God in the hand of the man of God. And so he goes out. God says, tell old Pharaoh to let my people go. And Pharaoh tried to compromise with him. And Moses turned loose the plagues under the power of God. Softened old Moses up and finally said, well, get out. Good riddance. And so they went over and they fought before them. And it was, that was a little vast of underneath the surface of the rock. And he hit it just right. And the water got back. God hit that rock so hard that there gushed out a fountain that met the needs of those people, not just for that day, but for days to come. And the New Testament, Paul tells us that that rock followed them. And I think it produced about five million gallons a day. And that's just not a little, little trickle of water. Because when you hold up a yielded life, and reassert that yield is it's in the midst of any problem, seas are going to open and seas are going to close and rocks are going to open and fountains are going to go down because the power of God, the person who's yielded to God and his life is an unexplainable... Then came Emily, the Bible says. You need to say that that's going to happen in your life. Amalek, of course, the kinsman of Esau. He represents the work of Satan, the force, the cause of God. They'll always say Amalek. Amalek may sometimes move through your wife, or through your husband, or through your children. May move through your boss. May meet you head on in your job. May meet you in the money, in the money world, or in the social world, or in the church world. But you can be sure that if you ever give yourself to the Lord, and that's going to come. He's going to hold up his hand and say, Halt! In the name of the law. And if you're still under the law, you have to halt. So if you're under grace, you say, Well, I've been free from the law, Mr. Emily. You just defeat it. In Jesus' name, I resist it. And hold up the rod, and you're defeated. Well, this is what happened. Amalek came and fought with Israel in the Valley of Lebanon. Now Moses is far off. He says, Joshua, say, what's the You go down in the valley and fight and fight out. Like, and I'm going up on the hill and lift up the rod of God. That time he thought on Moses. And there he's up there on top of the hill with a mouth with a, with a rod of God lifted up. And old Joshua just called the Amalek to a tree. And directly, he, he's weakened in his own cloth and he finds himself retreating. And it happens four or five times directly. Joshua gets back and looks a little, and Moses is up there. And you notice that every time Moses let the rod down, the animal tried to pull him. And every time he caught himself and lifted it up, it's not doing the usual to him. And Joshua said, uh huh. Which I've got to think of. When self is controlling a life, Satan is winning. When Jesus is controlling a life, he's winning. And it'll be a seesaw battle until there's an arrangement to keep Jesus lifted up. And Joshua sent a message up and said, Now, Aaron and her, you, uh, you got a hold of Moses and pop his hands up. One on either side. And you set him on a rock and fix him up where he can't let that thing down. And you hold it up. Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone and put it under him, and sat down, and he sat down, and Aaron and her stayed up his hands, one on one side, and the other on the other, a ministry of pride for Moses. And his hands were steady. His hands were steady. They were going down his hands. And I think it's just good looking. And Joshua was comforted and in the valley of Lepidus. That's just a nice rendering of saying he put the devil out of it in the valley of death. Do you get the point? Do you? But when we try to work it ourselves, we're defeated. We may try to be good church members, fire them, teach us, teach us, send us to a class and obtain the highest offices in the church. Two hours later, but we'll never be any more than we at our best can do. 
And when we give ourselves to God, things begin to pull together and happen that we couldn't have made happen in a minute. Simply because when God moves in, takes control of the life, anoints that life with his power, things have got to give. Do you realize that when this happens, seas open and, and seas close and water gushes out of rocks and in dry land and, and enemies are defeated in the valleys of life? I want to ask you a question. What kind of life do you want? So in order to answer that, I ask you another. What is that in your hand? Reputation? Who is that? What is it? A self-image? Who is that? What is it? A family? Throw them back. No, wait just a minute. Wait, just, no, throw them back. I never really had my family. Until I threw them down before the Lord. I pictured each of them in a cross. I never had a ministry until I threw it down before the Lord and saw myself in bed with cancer of the throat. I never saw victory until I threw it all down and said, God, I yield it all to you. Throw it down. What is that in your hand? A football? Throw it down. Oh, God wouldn't do a thing like that to me. He might. But then again, he might give that football back to you and you run in the power of God. Throw it down. A basketball? Throw it down. Boyfriend, girlfriend? Put it down before the Lord. Oh, God wouldn't take her away from me. Him away from me. He might. But then again, he just might give her back to you and your relationship sanctified. Throw it down. What do you have? A good reputation as a spiritual church? Throw it down. God might want to make not only your church a notable spiritual church, but an unexplainable, miraculous church. Go down. What is that in your hand? You can sit. Go down. Go down. Then God will make that a rod in your hand, through which the power of God will come. I wonder how many people here tonight have something in their hands that's perfectly fine and good and noble. But there's one thing you haven't done with it. That's give it up to the Lord. Or that. Relationship with husband and wife. Home. Job. Future. Car. What is it? Before that. Before that. Before you throw it down, the devil always has a piece of property to commute to. Throw it down and God will clean it up and give it back to you. If he doesn't, he'll give you something back. Throw it down. What is that in your hand? You want to walk away tonight with a rod of God in your hand? Every time you hold it up, a seal open or close, water will gush out of the rock to supply your need, or you'll meet an enemy and defeat him. God wants you to give it up to him. So he can give himself to you in unlimited power. Our heads bowed. Every head bowed. Now, this is a moment of honesty. In a moment, I'll be gone, praising the Lord for the privilege of being here. But I just want you to be honest now with God and yourself. I wonder how many people here would have to say tonight, Preacher, as you have preached, God has showed me something in my own life that I've never, ever thrown down before him. And I want you to pray for me that I will be willing tonight to put it down before the Lord in our faith. May I see your hand so I can pray for you all over this place, all over this place, all over dozen, dozen. Now you name that thing before the Lord, I see you. God bless you. I see you. Jesus, I don't know what all these things are, but I sure do know that something's wonderful, something wonderful is about to happen. When we give it up to you, maybe an illness, maybe an advantage, maybe somebody. Lord, I just, I just want to go through it again. I want to throw everything down before you. I want to throw my wife and my Tam and Tim. I want to 
throw my wonderful church down before you. I want to put down my ministry before you. I want to put down my health before you. I want to put down everything I have before you. God, you take it. You give me back only that which is sanctified and full of the power of Jesus. I'm just asking you to make out of this whole ugly life of mine an unexplainable miracle. That when folks see me, they won't be saying anything about Jack Taylor. But they'll be, they'll be left talking about Jesus Christ. What a wonderful Savior he is to use a clod like me. Bless young people who need to throw things down. Bless adults who need to throw things down. I just want you, Lord Jesus, to have your way now. And we want to go away with a holy anointing in our lives. In Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. There's not going to be any pressure in an invitation. This is what it is, an invitation. If tonight in your heart, you really want to give up that thing tonight God has laid on your heart. I'm going to ask you to couple with your desire a visible move, and I'm going to ask you to find yourself a place on your knees, somewhere, as near the front as you can get. And I want you to throw that thing down before the Lord in a recordable manner so that you can point to that time where a stake was driven and all of you became all of God. And I want you to do it right now. Right now. 40, 50, 60, 70, raise their hands. I don't want in any way embarrass you. But I want you to come right on right now. If you have a real desire to couple that desire with action tonight, I want you to come right on. Right on, right now. Yes? Maybe you need to talk to somebody. Maybe you need to talk to the preacher. He'll be here, you can find me. I'll be here, you can find me. There'll be somebody else. You come right on. You want to pray out loud? If you want to confess to somebody, if you want to share something that ought to be shared with everybody here, you do. But this will be a moment in which we just turn this service completely over to the Lord. When I feel like I ought to say a word, I'll say it. And you feel like you ought to say one, you'll just let God have his way. But I want you to find yourself here. I want you to throw that down before the Lord. You, you be with him now. You be sure you're with him. You come. I know this. Spirit's fullness. All it takes is one little link to break the power. 
One little broken leg. And we're just going to wait before the Lord this moment. And you feel like the Lord wants you to go, you can go. When somebody feels like they just ought to pray loud, and that'll be our signal to pray with you for that burden, we'll join you. Somebody wants to pray with one of the staff members in the staff, one of these others. You just come on. We go aside and take it to the Lord together. You can come through to victory. You have a desire to do it. That's all you need for victory. You don't have to wait any longer. You come right on right now.
pray and wasn't aware that someone was by my side to get next to me. And he told me what he wanted. And uh, I'm going to uh, ask him to show the view why he did it and what has happened. Now, yes, you haven't done this before, but the Holy Spirit will give you the boldness and the volume to speak. And we're going to listen. Oh, well, I was just because everybody else was doing it in my family. Yeah, I just want to take a few All right, and he heard. And we rejoice. And you'll receive him in our fellowship. And we'll start talking. And that's great. Betty. Why don't you come up here so we can uh, hear you and I'll get out of the way. You know, I'd just like to say that the Lord really came to me today. I'm really a rich person. And uh, I've known it for a long time. And the Lord forgave me a long time ago my sins. But the, I had one hang up until he made me willing, until I was willing to come to him and confess it publicly. Then, it wouldn't be all right. And so this morning, in the service, I came down, and I didn't, I just came to the altar, and I just wanted to pray. And I didn't know what the Lord would have for me. And I didn't think that he would have me confess his sin. And he sent a friend to my side. And we prayed. And I was able to confess it with a strength. And that was all that the Lord wanted me to do. And it was just wonderful. And he just cleansed me, and I just felt like I had a bath. I 
And I just wish that she would let me help her. She said, I'll read anything you bring to me. So she has some of the normal English of tools, books in her hands. She has God posts in her hands. She has the book of John in her hands. So you all pray. I'm looking for this woman, a lovely mother of two children, to find the Lord. And I want you to pray with her. <laughs> You heard me quote from the book on tiptoe with joy, read by David Seamans when he says, the impression minus expression equals depression. When a person is spirit filled, then every impulse I have come to believe is of God. We act upon these impulses, and if we don't, we'll be depressed. If we are confident that the impression is of the Holy Spirit, and we don't express it, we'll be depressed. So before we go tonight, I want to receive the assurance in my own heart that I'm not going to drive to Tulsa and back tonight depressed. And I think that there's something I ought to say. Marjorie expressed her fear. And I think there's something that all of us have experienced at one time or another. Because I like to be where it's safe, where there is no danger and no risk. And I don't like to be in the spotlight where everybody can take shots at me. And I am many times. And so sometimes I determine the course that I take by calculating how many pop shots I will be the recipient of because I've been afraid that you and you and you might say, well, what has got into John? Why would he lead us in this direction? Don't we know that we've got a program to follow and an order of service to follow? We get out at 8.30 every evening. Now, I've been aware of what some of you were thinking about what was going on this week because it's so unusual. And I'm the pastor, and humanly speaking, I'm responsible for a few things. If it goes good or it goes bad, if it goes bad, I feel responsible, and I don't want it to go bad. This is because of my pride. And I just want to say that I have been afraid that maybe we would go to the extremes and people would misunderstand me and you would misunderstand me for you. It appears that I have a, a facility that I wasn't aware of and that's to say things and people misunderstand them. Sometimes I can say something is white and people will go away saying, well, John said that was black. When I thought I was being clear about it. I don't know whether it's the tone of my voice or the expression on my face, but sometimes I evidently don't communicate. And people think that I'm hard and that they have misunderstood and I have offended them. I may have, mis I may have offended some of you. I think probably I have. And I just want you to know that it, if I have, it's because I hear people say, well, I said that to say this. But well, I know where they got that. That's just an example. A church is a reflection of its pastor, providing that pastor has been there for any period of time. Now, I've said that, say this. I have come to an awareness in my own life and in my own ministry that I have taken you 
as far as I can go. In my Christian pilgrimage. And if you go any further, I'm going to have to make some advancement personally in my own life. Now we've gone a long way together. I haven't gone ahead of you too many times. We've been together. Some of you have been away ahead of me. We've gone together. But I have come to a new awareness in my own life that if we continue to probe and to delve and investigate and study and learn and conquer, I've got to make some progress myself. For I don't think that you're going to go too far ahead of me. You may for a while, but you'll backslide back where I am in the rear. So I've got to keep in the vanguard as a pastor, I think. And I said that simply to say that I want you to hold me up in your prayers just as Aaron and her supported the hands of Moses. I want to feel the comfort and the warmth of your prayer support that I might continue to, to develop and mature in my ministry that I might be in a position to lead you on to greater heights. I've been on the mountains, but the mountains have been very slick, and I slid off. I climb up again, and I hope that, uh, that you'll help me and, and pray for me and be patient, that I might continue to probe, to study, that when we come together for corporate worship, I might have a fresh word from the Lord. Now, as I said, in the beginning, I articulate so poorly, and people misunderstand me, but I hope you've understood not only what I've said, but you've understood the spirit behind it. Now, I suppose that's all I've got to say. Is everybody ready to go home? Bob? Most of you people know me for many, many years. I've been to the church since 1936. This, up until a few weeks ago, was my church. I've helped build it. I've sweated blood on it. If anybody said anything against it, I was ready to fight it. Because it was my church. It isn't. It's stone, it's wood, and it can collapse. And the Lord will do whatever needs to be done, no matter what. But I think for what I try to do. I'd help build it back if that's what it took. I've said some things that I know, as Brother John has said, I have hurt somebody's feelings. Probably a lot of feelings. I'm sorry. Very sorry. If you tell me who, who you are, I'll apologize to you in front of you. So I drink. But from now on, this is the Lord's house, and I'll do whatever I can. to be mad at you. But I love all of you. 
even my husband. But the reason I came just last Sunday, rather than be two by week, I was converted here and I feel I was complete turnabout and I felt so good all week. But I had two sisters in law that were me along very good. So I wrote one of them letters and called the other one to tell them. So I feel good. <laughs> and I wanted to ask you what time you're going to work on the talk in the morning. Could we relieve you of your errand? I appreciate that, but I wouldn't miss it for the world. <laughs> Thank you, Thank you for that. Now, let me tell you, this is so vital because we need to let the redeemed of the Lord say so. We need to voice the fact with this fact that this is God's church. You know what I've realized? And I told my deacons last week. That when God takes over a church, we lose out in trying to set where it's going or what it's going to be. We just lost that. And I, I confess that to my deacons. I, seven years ago, I lost out. Why, well, we had five-year programs, and we knew exactly how efficient we were going to have our church and set it in that community, and we were going to do this, and we were going to do that. And God snatched the leadership of that church right out of my hand. And I've realized for seven years I've had no more to do with where it's going than anything in the world. And I just shared that with my deacons last week. God wants to make out of a church. He will shatter all your ideas. Shatter all your dreams about what church ought to be. If I would tell you some of the things that are already on the horizon because of this. Uh, it is just uh, blow your mind. God wants to do the same thing here. And I'll tell you what blesses us to know than anything, and what blesses other people is to hear men and women in that church stand up and say, I'm with God. I want to go with him. There's a song we've heard since we've been in revival. God is moving by his spirit. This is revival time. And and the and the thing that goes over and over again, move with God. Folks, God is moving. He doesn't want you to tell him where to go. He doesn't want you to prescribe the avenues he want, you want him to move. He wants you to latch on to him and move with God. He wants to do something in God. Believe he's going. And we need to let the redeemed of the Lord say so and not be bashful about it. I think I'll just, since I'm leaving tonight, go ahead and say this. I probably wouldn't say it if I was going to be here a little long. I get the impression. I get the impression that uh, you're much like our church here. You have a nice building and lovely padded shoes, and you've even got more than we. You've got carpet all over the place. And sometimes, because we're a sort of middle, upper, upper class, we think that if we ever got excited, that would be a sign of the loss of dignity. And I'll tell you what some of you need to do. You need to just let your hair down and let Jesus say what he wants to say. And you need just to say, well, hallelujah, so there it is, you know? And uh, it'll be, it, it's just so wonderful and so shocking and so much the freedom. So, uh, if you've got it, If he's put something in your heart, don't suppress it. Express it. It's pride that keeps us from being natural. And if you love a formality or love a form or love an image more than you love naturalness in Jesus, he's got to work a plowing up old stuff. 
in your life. So maybe you just need to say it. Young people, you know who did it first in our church? That's what shook the adults up, young people being honest. Now, I must explain to you that we adults have lived a little longer and have learned how to be dishonest. And uh, don't, don't learn like we did. We, we hide so many things and we get so hypocritical. You be honest and that'll demand us honesty. So if you've got something to say, you think, and it'll bless some adults. Maybe it'll encourage them to be honest, too. Okay? Thank you. Now then, I want Rick to stand down here, and I see his mother back there. She's been in the nursery. She's evening. Sherry, she's standing. She's been nothing. To come down and stand with Rick, you come around and encourage him and rejoice with him. And I think that we will not have a benediction. We will just have another love in which you embrace one another and shake hands with one another, speak to one another, visit with one another, and just linger around as, as long as you want to linger. And before we do, I think that Terry and Stan ought to come now before they get Stan people while you're all in the pew. Were you up here a while ago, Terry? With Rick? Well, that's unfortunate. I wish you no more faithful souls in our church than Terry Huff. He stays in that nursery. And the rest of us want to see what's going on up here. And I wish that you could have been here a while ago. You know what happened?